All right, AP Statistics. This is the solution for the final review practice test, which um, we had on Friday. And I know that um, the exam being on Wednesday doesn't count towards your grade. Uh, I would encourage you to please take it as many and most of you are taking the AP test. And I think that going through the final exam on Wednesday will give you a great chance to practice that time constraint of 45 minutes. And it will also give you a good idea of where the gaps are that we're going to fill in uh, until May 22nd. Um, so, uh, so here's look at question one. Ninety-three percent of students in the AP class turn their assignments on time. Eighty-five turn their assignments with every problem complete. Eighty percent uh, turn their assignments in time with every question completed. So my favorite way to interpret these problems is with the tree diagram. All right. So they said ninety-three percent of the homework is on time, uh, which insinuates that 7% of the homework is late. Um, they tell us that 80% of the homework is on time and complete. Um, and so the takeaway here is that they tell us that 85% of the homework is complete. So what that tells us is that 5% of the homework is late and completed. 5%. So, so that's where those numbers come from. Um, and so what we're looking for is the conditional probability of the chance of being complete given that it's late. Uh, and so that's going to be the probability of being late in the denominator, which is the 7%. And the chance of being complete and late is this 5%. So when I calculate that, I get about 71%. And that's the conditional right here. So given that the homework is late, 71% um, of those homework problems are complete. Mr. Atkins randomly selects student assignments one at a time. What's the chances the first assignment he finds that is not turned in on time with every question complete is one of the five selected? <laughs> this was the hardest question on the entire thing. Uh, I think there's some ambiguity playing here, but when we look at his solution, um, I think what he's saying is that the chances of, so the chances of the number of assignments checked before a late or incomplete. So what does that mean? To answer that question, let's look at our tree diagram again. So I'm having, I'm missing this fourth number. So 80 plus 13 plus 5 percent, that leaves 2 percent. Okay, so the chance of being late or incomplete is, is this number, 13 percent are our time but incomplete, and the 7 percent. So these three numbers is the chances that an assignment is late or incomplete. So that's a 20% chance. Now the first solution uses a geometric distribution, which is something that we skipped over. Um, I think it's a little redundant, uh, but you can look at this if you want. I guess the main place I want you to look at is this um, the second solution where it says X is a binomial. So we've um, the probability that X is more than one is the same as the probability that one uh, of one minus the chances of X being zero. So it's one minus the chance that every paper is uh, complete and turned in on time. So the chances that every paper is complete and turned in on time is 80%. So one minus 0.8 to the fifth is going to give us the chances that at least one is either late or not complete. Third question. Um, Atkins has 70 total uh, students. Describe the distribution of the proportion of papers that are turned in complete and on time. So this is a, um, a sampling distribution of proportions uh, with a chance of success at 80 percent and the sample size of 70. So let me illustrate that for you. Um, if I go to Schoology, I can find an applet that will show me exactly what this distribution looks like with 70 kids, that's uh, your sample size, and the chances of success. So what's, what's happening here is they're simulating if I randomly grab uh, 70 kids uh, and each one has a chance of 80 percent, there's going to be some variability. Um, sometimes there's going to be, um, uh, most of the time, there's going to be 56 of those kids that have their paper turned in, but sometimes you're going to get 
you know, 50. Sometimes you're going to get all of them at a rare occurrence, but this gives you the distribution we're describing. And so here's the description we need to have. We need to have socks. We need to have the uh, center, uh, which was the 80%. That's going to be the average of all your p-hats. We need to have the spread, which is the standard deviation here. Um, and then we also need to show that uh, the normal conditions are satisfied. So the fact that you have the chance of success at 56 and the chance of failure at 14, that will imply that this distribution is not normal. And so just to illustrate that, if, if your sample size goes down below to where that 10% condition is not satisfied, um, not 10%, excuse me, but the, the, the chance of success being 10 or more. So with this chance of success, we're looking at 24 times the 80%. Um, I know that's more than 10, but the chance of failure is 24 times the 20%, which is the five. And so this distribution would not be considered normal enough to satisfy the normal condition when it comes to proportions. Uh, these are my least favorite questions. Uh, it just seems redundant to go through this arduous process, but here's what you have to remember. Um, when we're describing these simulations or randomizations, you have to describe it to someone who, when they follow the process, will get the same results as somebody else. So explain how we can conduct a simulation. So we're going to assign uh, random digits 1 through 100. Um, 1 through 93 would indicate that it's turned in on time, and 94 through 100 is, is the late. And then select 70 random numbers, look to see if more than two of them are between the 94 and 100. And so um, this is, uh, I'll let you just read this, but these are, uh, you find this when they want you to describe randomization on an experiment or when to run a simulation. All right, fifth question. Um, Mr. Atkins' uh, classes are now involved in remote learning, and he's worried that the proportion of assignments that are completed or on time have decreased, so he's going to do an experiment. Um, so our explanatory is going to be the learning method, traditional versus remote, and we're seeing if that has an effect on the assignment completed and on time. All right, so this is an observational study. Uh, an experiment would have to have some sort of treatment imposed on the subjects. Um, describe a method which could, uh, so a mass pair design is when you um, typically have the, the units are subject, the are people or subjects, and you would give a treatment to that person and do a pre and post measurement. So what he says here is that you choose an individual student at random, compare that student's completion percentage with their percentage after the switch, and then each student would then be paired with themselves. So this is where you would see those uh, paired t-tests or the one sample t-test that we've seen in the chapter nine. Mr. Atkins wants to use the results of his study <coughs> to construct a 95% confidence interval looking for the conditions. So, uh, boy, this is huge. Random, independent, the 10% rule, and normality. And so the mistake I see a lot of kids make is with the normality condition, they want to use the central limit theorem, but the central limit theorem only applies to uh, the distribution of means or sampling distribution of means. With proportions, we're looking for those successes and failures being more than 10. All right, so the confidence interval here is provided for us. And so at this point, it might be good to, um, there's a lot of people speculating that with the AP test being online and at home, uh, they're trying to make it equitable. And so what that means is a lot of people are speculating that there will not be a whole lot of calculator use on, on this test, uh, thinking that some students won't have access to a calculator. It makes sense to me, so, so don't be surprised. And I'm hoping maybe the AP uh, calculus kids can verify this, is that um, there won't be many or a lot of questions that require you to use a calculator. And so this is a good example of that. Uh, they're providing you with the confidence interval, and you need to be able to interpret that. Um, based on the results of this confidence interval, do you believe there is convincing evidence? So we are 95% confident that the proportion of assignments completed and on time for the traditional school is between 4 and 32%. So there's your context. Um, because this confidence interval includes zero, we do not have convincing evidence of a difference of proportions. 
All right, second question. A random sample of 29 employees of a large company have their systolic blood pressure checked. The summary statistics are provided. And so this is going to, uh, it does require a calculator. Um, so uh, to backtrack a little bit, they could ask you this question on the AP test and just provide, they might just ask you to provide the, the formula or the, the calculation you would perform with a calculator. Um, so with a mu of 122 and a standard deviation of 20, we're going to just use our normal CDF, uh, labeling what those three numbers represent, and then actually four numbers, and then and get 16%. Um, this is another distribution to describe. This is uh, not a sampling distribution. This is the distribution of the summary statistics. Um, so uh, once again, there's socks here, right? You have the shape, center, and spread. Uh, notice that they're referencing the spread with standard deviation and they're referencing the center with the mean. Now, I guess they're about the same, so either one would work for that. Okay, so this company CEO wants to know if the mean systolic blood pressure at our company is higher than the national average, so this is starting our test of significance. Uh, we're going to let mu be the true mean systolic blood pressure for all employees at the company. And the detail here is important. If you just said the true mean systolic blood pressure, you'd probably get dinged because you need to reference the population as the employees of the company. And we're trying to make a test uh, about those people. And so we're, we think that their average blood pressure is 122 with the alternative that's more. So uh, once again, um, here's we're not being asked to perform the test. I still believe that they will ask you to perform some sort of test on the actual exam on the 22nd, but we, we aren't asked to do that here. They go ahead and get a T value, a T score of 5.5 with a very, very low P value. And so look at the context that they're asking for. Assuming the mean systolic blood pressure in this company is 122, so assume the null is true, there is a probability of only a really low number of obtaining a sample of 29 with the mean blood pressure of the one we received. This is essentially impossible so we have convincing evidence to reject the null. Explain in context what you would mean by type 2 error. So uh, a type 2 error in this problem would be deciding not to reject the null hypothesis and saying that the mean systolic blood pressure of employees in this company is not over 122, when in fact it's greater than 122. Now it should be noted that on the previous question, um, it's not it's possible that we committed a type 1 error. So I, I think a better follow-up question would have been, uh, what type of error could you have committed with this p-value? And you would say the, uh, the type of error is a type 1 where we fail to reject where we reject the null, uh, but it's actually not false. <laughs> okay, finally, we have these uh, the latest, what we've been learning with scatter plots. Uh, so in addition, let's see, the re systolic blood pressure of 29 employees, their ages are recorded, a linear regression model to fit. All right, so they're seeing there's a connection between age and blood pressure. And so this is more about reading a computer output than anything else. Um, so this 97.0771 is your y-intercept. This 0.9493 is the slope of the least squares regression line. And this is your uh, constant of determination. You have to find your um, regression coefficient, your correlation coefficient, by square rooting that number. So if I take the square root of 0.712, I get 0.84. So the correlation coefficient is actually 84%, um, and that's the number you're going to reference here below. Um, so it says comment on the strength direction form. So notice they're finding what not the um, R squared value is, but they're going to reference the correlation coefficient when talking about the strength, 0.85. There's a strong positive linear relationship. It's strong because R is more than 80%. Um, it's positive because the slope of the line is positive and the linear model fits the data. Uh, now in the previous question, interpret the slope. So this, and once again, we're gonna grab that number from the chart. The slope of the regression line is 0.9493.
This means that for each additional year of age, the model predicts an increase in systolic blood pressure of 0.943. So, so we're interpreting as the as a change of y over change of x, right? So as age increases by one, um, your um, blood pressure increases by almost one as well.